How many of you have ever been um, to Disney World? <coughs> many been to Disney World? Yes. And, uh, and, and Disney World is, is, is enormous. And uh, that's why they call it Disney World instead of Disneyland. Disneyland is smaller. <laughs> Disney World is bigger. Anyway, you always have to park way out in the middle of nowhere. Do you remember the place that you parked when you went to Disney World last? Yeah. Goofy or Pluto? Yeah, I did. You know, I, I can't remember. I think it was one of the seven dwarfs, but we all couldn't remember which one. But uh, when we parked way the heck out there, they sent this little thing across the parking lot, and it was kind of like the different, the, the, it was like a, a golf cart, but long and full of many small little carts, kind of like a trolley and a golf cart kind of merged together. It's kind of mm -hmm. weird. And while you're while you're driving through, the guy will say, "You're in Goofy right now, or whatever it is, you know." And just remember that on your way out, so you can be able to find your way your way back to your car. And then they uh, they go through this whole thing, and they they'll say, you know, on your right is the largest uh, 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 group of of, of uh, hedge hedge uh, what do you call it statues, sculpture. you know, uh, <laughs> tree sculptures uh, that, that in the Western Hemisphere, you know, and you're like, okay. But you get all this along the way, you get all these uh, little little tour guide kind of tidbits. And, and I always wondered who it was that was actually talking to me. And then I realized, it's the guy at the very front, the one driving. He's so familiar with, uh, with, with everything because he's driven the same route about a thousand times. And so he's so familiar with everything that he can just kind of give you all these tidbits of wonderful information about where you're going along the way. And he is your guide. And what we're going to talk a, a, a little bit about today is the Holy Spirit as our, as our guide, isn't he? And uh, as our guide, hey, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's think about that for a minute. The Holy Spirit is our guide because he's familiar with the way. Isn't that, isn't that what it takes is a guide who is, a, a guide is somebody who is, has uh, become familiar with the way. Isn't that right? They can't, yes. they can't guide you unless they've been there before several times usually. And the Holy Spirit is our guide to the way. But what's interesting is when we say that Jesus is the way, I want you to look at, uh, look at things from, uh, not from the earthly perspective, but from the heavenly perspective about when we say Jesus is the way. Because um, when we tend to think about Jesus as the way, we're thinking Jesus is the way that I found God. Jesus is the way that I accepted God. You know? And that, that's true. But, uh, you know, I, I want to introduce you to a little something here. And I know it might rock your world, but you are not the center of the universe. Isn't that right? That's true. And I know that's kind of hard to grasp because we live in a world where everything is pretty much centered around it. You know, it, believe it or not, there was a time when people actually thought the greater populace of the earth thought that everything revolved around the earth. And uh, some greater minds tend to get us to think outside of that and, and recognize that we are not the center of the universe. But even the way that we approach the things of God can be from that perspective. That, that it's, it's us first. Like, like God was out there and we, because of our decision, we're saved. Now don't get me wrong. It's true that because of our decision, we're saved. But you do understand that somebody else 
already decided to accept you if you excited, if you decided to accept them. It, it's not earthward towards heaven. It's actually everything that is outside of this worldly realm is actually entirely revolutionary thinking about everything is God first. Now think about that for a minute. That only in this world is that the exception. Everywhere else outside of this world, the rule is God first. And so Jesus kind of illustrated that when he said, starting out to teach us in prayer, he started out by teaching us, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Trying to revolutionize or even just simply write this area, this worldly attitude that we're the center of things and God's on the outside. When really, God is the center of everything and we're on the outside of what God intended for life to be all about. We're trying now to accept what God has already done for us. Everything in life that we have that is worth having is because God wanted it first. It's an amazing concept to think that everything that is worth having, God wanted you to have it before you knew you wanted it. We wouldn't even know what we want if it wasn't for God having shown us what life can truly be. And therefore now we want that. So it's really all about God first. That is, that is the entire heartbeat of creation. We are the only ones that are coming into that understanding as we get born again. We're finally entering into the what you say, the rhythm of creation, which is it has this pumping heartbeat, God first. It's all because God wanted it. Nothing existed, remember? It's, you know, nothing of this is of our making, or nothing that we even want that's worth having is because of our own initiative. It's God's initiative that created life, that made it all possible, that gives it a reason for being. And once you experience that, you come into the way that the kingdom was meant to be. Now, the reason I say that is because when we think of Jesus as the way, we often think again that it's earthward towards God, not really recognizing that it was meant when Jesus said, I am the way, he meant also that he was a double door, if you will, that he was the only way, as in the only means through which God could express himself. Everything else was in glimpses and, and small little pieces. But only Jesus was the means through which God could truly express himself. And say, okay, now are you ready? Because this is what I'm all about. And he would express himself fully through Jesus. You could see God just like visually, but you could see him, you could comprehend, you could understand what he was wanting and how he expressed himself through both what he did and what he said. And you could see that Jesus was the only way, not just for us, this, this narrow niche through which we have to fit in order to approach God, but rather the narrow niche through which God himself could finally express who he was, what he was all about to us. So Jesus was the way and is the way for God to have expressed himself. Now, when we say we talked about the guide, the Holy Spirit is here to give us the same kind of a, of a life that Jesus had. 
Because sometimes we think of Jesus' life as his life because he's the Son of God, not recognizing that he, by the Holy Spirit, was living the same life that God has given to us and called us to live. And so this same life that Jesus showed us, not only what God was all about, but how he involved and how he changed the life of the person in whom he lived. Jesus is our example of that life that he lived, and the Holy Spirit is the same for us as he was for Jesus. So let's look at a couple of verses together to help us to kind of see some things. Right, uh, in John 1 and 8, we, we're talking about some of the things that Jesus said that in this case he says, no man, and, and I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation because I, I like the way that it reads. It says here, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed him to us. So here we see that Jesus, when it says, no man has seen God. Now, I, I did a quick survey, and I recognized that uh, Moses saw God, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Abraham, he, he saw God. Now, these are just a few of the people that I know just straight up saw God, right? Abraham saw God. Remember when uh, the angel came and uh, God was talking with Abraham and, 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 and so he was there like walking with him Adam, I mean let's go right back Adam saw God, right? He walked with God in a cool day and, uh, and Eve and, and then Enoch, you know, he walked with God for he was uh, no more and he walked pretty much walked off with God so there are people that have seen God, so then when it says that no man has seen God, it must mean that it is more than just to observe or even to interact with, but to truly comprehend him. And so if we look at that verse again in the uh, living, it says, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who himself is God. He is near the Father's heart. So we're talking not just to be able to observe God or to see things about him, but to understand his heart. Is that right? So only Jesus could express to us like nobody else could have ever can express to us the Father. Partially because he says, as he says here, he is God, but because also he is near to the Father's heart. Nobody else had that same kind of a relationship with God. And yet, through new birth, we have the opportunity to experience what sonship is all about, what being a child of God is all about. Though he had it because he was born into fellowship with God by the Holy Spirit, because he's born of the Spirit, we are born of God when we are adopted into the family of God, aren't we? God accepts us and, and, and takes us into his family without exclusion, without exclusion to uh, the benefits that Jesus had become ours. As a child, as a father, and as a parent, as a family member, we share the same exclusive relationship that Jesus had and the only thing that makes him uh, unique was his being made flesh you know, God being made flesh but as far as relationship to the Father he has given to us the same relationship with the Father that he shared on earth so that uh, we can experience the kind of life that God wanted us and wants for creation to not only have but to see through us all right, so if you will turn with me um, to John 16, it'll be in obviously a few chapters away. We'll turn, we'll get there in just a minute. All right, so all, a lot of these people have seen God, but they have not truly experienced Him. Only Jesus has truly experienced God, and out of that true experience, that, and I'm talking not just with God before creation, I'm talking as the Jesus we saw and see through the scriptures, this is the kind of relationship with God that he says can be ours. The same as he experienced is the same we can experience. So, um, 
I'm just going to refer to this in John. Uh, I call John Jesus' best man. <laughs> you know, John actually called himself the best man in one of his uh, when when he was saying, you know, the the bride belongs to the groom, but the best the best man stands on the sidelines and kind of helps and 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 makes it all part. He's part of it, but he's not the focus of it. You know, and so that was part of the I must decrease and he must increase kind of thing. But not only is he Jesus' best man, but if you'll uh, kind of note in your, in your notes one of these scriptures that's uh, kind of cool is uh, Luke 7 and 28. In it, Jesus says, there's none greater than John the Baptist, born of women. You know, that's a pretty, pretty daunting, uh, uh, I guess, level of, for, for, for God to, to uh, to say about somebody. At the same time, though, if you understand, though, what it's really saying is that there's uh, that also means that anyone in the kingdom, because he says, yet, yet, in the kingdom of God, the least is greater than John. So if all of the people that were born of a woman didn't equal John, but yet the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John, that means that you have a whole different realm of relationship than John had the capacity to have, doesn't it? Even though he had the best he could have of all the people that could have it, he didn't have it as well as the newcomer, the startup in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven has new birth, a relationship with God that allows, like Jesus, to live like Jesus lived. And I, I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing for a while there, isn't it? To think of, think of us being able to live the kind of life that Jesus lived, and not because uh, we try so hard, but to recognize that Jesus was the way that God showed himself and that we too can be the way that God shows himself because the Holy Spirit is our guide to how to live the kind of life that God wanted for us. And sometimes that kind of life doesn't make sense to us, but we can in faith trust that the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction will give to us the kind of life that we see exemplified in the life of Jesus. Right? You say, well, yeah, Jesus died. That wasn't a very cool way to end your life. Well, it was a part of a plan, a unique plan, for he alone that the rest of us could have life. So his obedience even unto death means our obedience will bring us into life, the same life that he's enjoyed now, seated at God's right hand, given the name above every name. Now, the Holy Spirit deposits the nature of God into the human spirit. See, when, uh, when Mary was willing, which is cool to think about, Mary was a, a willing partner of God's that allowed her to be the mother of Jesus, the physical body, providing a physical body for the Holy Spirit to deposit the nature of God into. And that we become those same similar in experience. We get the nature of God in these earthen vessels. Because our spirit, he deposits the nature of God into our human spirit. And we become able to experience that God first lifestyle that is everywhere else around us but on in the world. That is that when, when we get outside of that this realm, it's going to be so mind-blowing to see that everything was about God. You know, you're thinking, oh my gosh, what about dinner? What about lunch? What about a roof over my head? What about my car? You know, and it's like, everyone else in creation is like, really? And I know it seems so hard to think about that right now. But we live in the only dirt hole <laughs> in, in the universe, you know, where, where it's in a fallen state and that everything doesn't revolve around God. We're part of the revolution experiencing that from the inside out that allow us to be able to connect with the way everything is in reality outside of the sphere in which we live. Mm -hmm. I don't mean just will be. That's a current reality that everything revolves around God. It's a God-first creation. 
because creation itself wouldn't have a reason to exist if it wasn't for its recognition of God. And it does that through every fiber of its being all the time. It's phenomenal. And then we're, we're the only ones just kind of catching on to that. You know? Little by little. I ask you to turn to John 16 and uh, 12 through 11. Let's turn over there real quick. The Holy Spirit is doing on the inside of us what Jesus could only do on the outside of us. Let's read it real quick. He says in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, I like that. I like that there's hope. I, I, I wouldn't like to be left where Jesus said, I'd like to tell you a lot more, but I can't. Wouldn't that stink? I'd really like to be able to share with you, but sorry. But here he says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Let's continue on. He says, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. And all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Nutshell. You've got to understand that, that it is never God that is diminishing the, the amount of, of life that is at your disposal. God's not withholding anything. He can't because he's already given it to Jesus. And Jesus said he'd give you the spirit. And each of them has been handed down the, ex, the, the, the enormity, the, the full expanse of God to each other and then to us because of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Now granted, your mind can't take it all in at one time, but it doesn't mean because God has decided not to do or share something of His nature with us. His nature and intention towards us and the, aware, the, the, the knowledge of His will for us is there for us by the Holy Spirit as we draw on and as we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us who God truly is outside of the realm in which we've been like accustomed. All right, so the Holy Spirit, listen to this again. The Holy Spirit is doing on the inside of us what Jesus could only do on the outside. Jesus could only take us so far because he didn't have an inward power to reveal except by the Holy Spirit. So he says, the Holy Spirit is going to come and he'll do for you what I was unable to fully disclose to you. I could only give you as much as your natural mind could comprehend. Um, my son and I were reading some things and as we were reading, we're going through the book of John and, and he would say, oh my gosh, he'd say something and people would like totally misinterpret it. I mean, you go through the various the, uh, experiences of the scriptures from Nicodemus, you know, how can I enter back into my mother's womb? And you're like, wow, did you really ask that question? Did, did you really have to ask that? And then he'd say, uh, you know, you can, you, if, you, if you want to be a follower, you've got to eat my flesh and, and drink my blood. You know, and they're like, lots of people left from that point on. And then he turns and he says, well, what about you? Where are you going? Are you going to leave too? They say, well, we don't have anywhere else to go. <laughs> but the idea is that they would go from time to time, place to place, and rarely put the pieces together. And you're like, how could that happen? Well, I found out that the Holy Spirit could explain it pretty easily, at least to me. And that was, uh, we watched this movie, and it was about, uh, I don't watch it. It wasn't worth watching. But I didn't know it until the end. Hmm. So I'll save you the horrors. Not that it was a horror flick, but I'm saying it was just 
a waste of time for the most part. But this is a, a true story, so the true story still applies. And that is that there was a guy that he was, he was uh, to create a means to crack the code during the war that the Nazis were using to communicate with one another. So he became obsessed with this, and he, he, he found a way to finally crack the code to where he could decrypt all of this communication that was taking place. But without it, you could even sit there and you could receive it. You could, you could hear it. It wouldn't even be hidden. It'd be like, oh, they're saying, they're saying, and that's all it sounded like. They couldn't, they couldn't decrypt it. But it was available for everybody, right out there in the open. But without the encryption key, the encryption key, there was no capacity to truly understand what was being said. And if you think about the human mind, it, it can hear what's being told to it. It can, it can hear what's being said by, by a person or through reading. But the, the ability to decrypt, you need that decryption through a key. The Holy Spirit is that key that literally makes it possible for you just to not hear, not, with, not, not observe or hear, but from the inside out for you to be able to have understanding of what's being said or done without having your natural mind be the, the connecting point. And later on, at least it is for, for me, I believe, probably for everybody, your mind finally catches on a little later, you know, and, and you're like, oh. Okay, well, now I have some new information to work with. But the Holy Spirit is that, that key, so we can go through life much like they did, and, and without the Holy Spirit, end up hearing but not understanding, seeing but not really observing. You know? And that's why the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, when He's come, He's going to be in the encryption key on the inside of you, so that everything that I've been saying, you can finally understand. Hmm. You know? Yeah. Because otherwise you were just hearing blah 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 yeah. blah blah blah. You know, Jesus is you know, he's healing people and he goes blah 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 <laughs> You know, and you're like, What? Because no encryption key. You know, you didn't you didn't have it. He says, Once you've got that, then you can truly understand what God was doing and what he was saying through the life you've observed. And you'll spend the probably the rest of your natural life taking from the three years that Jesus, or approximately three years that Jesus spent showing the Father, you'll spend probably the rest of your natural life working with the encryption, you know, decrypting everything that was done and said in that three years. Because mind-blowingly, if you looked at the end of the Gospel, it says, had everything that Jesus did and said, you know, been written, that, that the world couldn't contain the books. I mean, there's, there's a lot that took place. But much like uh, concentrated orange juice that I make sometimes, you know, it was condensed. And that meant powerful. So let's take the decryption of the Holy Spirit to let that become the life example that Jesus gave to us. Remember, our way, when Jesus said, I am the way, he didn't just mean, I am your way to however you want, whenever you want, approach and get to know God. Again, that's, that's the earthly perspective. Thinking about it that Jesus was the way, the perfectness of time, at the right time, God displayed himself to us through Jesus. And because of that display, Jesus now becomes the way that we can see the life that God wants us to experience. So when we, when we think about uh, our options to share Christ with people, our options to pray for the sick, our options to cast out devils, can I tell you that it shouldn't really be an option. What it really should be is 
we saw Jesus do this. He is our way. God has made it possible for us to live the same kind of abundant life that Jesus showed us was possible. So now let's do it. Let's do it the way he did it. And live by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, letting him decrypt the small and large ways that God can release himself through our lives like he did through the life of Jesus. Because it's always a God first mentality. So I'd like for us to write our, write our minds. How many times did somebody come into your life? I'm sure you're like me. Little ways and little times that somebody came into my life and tried to tell me about Jesus and I was like totally oblivious. You know? Because I hadn't received the, the encryption key. You know, I hadn't, hadn't, wasn't able to decrypt anything. It seemed so foreign to me. Ooh, you have a relationship with Jesus. How nice for you. Where's your fairy godmother? You know, it was really a foreign concept to me. Boy, that was, that was a judgmental look. <laughs> but when you're on the outside of this thing, it's about that. Hmm. You're like, yeah. totally, it just doesn't make any sense, doesn't connect. But when you decide to recognize, hey, I'm going to become a part of the creation that's obedient to God. And you say, okay, I'm in. Jesus says, great, you were already in, you just didn't renew it. And he, he starts to pour into you. Mm -hmm. So it's really God first. God wanted you in his kingdom. Jesus made the way. You now have access to God because it was God's intention for you and he's holding nothing back from you. So in this point in life, let's dedicate ourselves to letting the Holy Spirit be our guide. Now, hopefully you didn't necessarily go too far into the Disney and trolley ride, but you recognize that you do need a guide. You need somebody to direct you in how to live the life that Jesus displayed. He showed us it's possible. He showed us it's possible to get out of the rut, to stop living for what you make every day and the food you need to eat and the bills you need to pay. And he showed us it's possible not to be at the mercy of life itself. So with that, let's step outside of that kind of a worldly perspective and begin to ask the Holy Spirit to decrypt the way that Jesus showed me as possible to me. Can we do that together? Holy Spirit, you're that key. You're the way we can live the life that God wanted us to have. We didn't even know that we wanted it until you showed us the kind of life that was possible. So, Holy Spirit, thank you for being my guide. My personal guide in the way of Jesus. Thank you for teaching me the abundance, the life that is mine in him. Thank you for helping me resist temptation to put everything that this world thinks is life ahead of the way that Jesus showed life is meant to be experienced. And help me to live a God first, not just as in, I put God first, or I make Jesus Lord, because He is Lord, whether I ever make Him Lord or not. So that shows me that what is in the Spirit is there before I could even have recognized. It's not there because I put it there. It's there because God put it there. And if I'm in Christ, it's because God's put me there. And I want to just put my will in with his to let everything that he wants me to have be an experience not only from him but from him to others in my life in the name of the Lord
Lord Jesus, thank you, Holy Spirit, for being my guide to the way of life that Jesus had. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Churning, churning, churning. Feel the churning? Feel the burn? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the Holy Spirit, you know. Churning and burning. Right on in there. Getting stirred up. Because there's more to life than even going to church. There's more to life than singing songs. You know? And then as we make this more interactive, let me take a couple of minutes of your time. And I'm already booting here. <laughs> Boot the old way of doing things real quick here and just Right now, I'd like for us to, uh, to uh, pray with one another. So take a minute to uh, stretch across there, join some hands, and uh, just pray. Pray in the way that we talked about this morning where God first. And uh, what I want you to do quickly is uh, if you could share with somebody one of the ways you don't have to, when I said join hands, I know you get tired of joining hands for any more 30 or 40 seconds. So you can drop hands for a minute to share, to share this very thing. That is that um, I want you to think about one of the ways right now that, um, that you're asking people to agree with you in prayer to uh, let the life of God be evident in yours. Maybe you realize in one of those areas of your life you say, well, there's this is an area of my life that uh, that I'm, I'm asking Jesus to be more obvious in through my life, you know, like the life of God. And so, just be honest with each other. Say, you know what? This is one of the areas where I'm asking you to come into agreement with prayer. So, maybe it's your finances. Examples. Maybe you're like, you know, I'd like to say that God is my source, but that's so difficult for me to see that God could supply my needs. I feel like I'm really always having to go out there and bang the pavement and, you know, I don't feel like it's, it happens very fluidly. I feel like I'm always working hard, you know, and, or, or maybe it's some other things, maybe, you know, relationships or something. But right now, uh, just whatever it is that you can share with somebody and you say, you know what, this is an area where the life of God, the life that God wants me to have, isn't what I'm seeing, and I'm asking for your prayers. So quickly, businesses, jobs, family, whatever it is, finances. There's some area probably that you're saying, you know, if if what Jesus showed and what I'm not showing, I want to show what Jesus showed in His life healing maybe, you know, not physically not well. You know, those are all areas that Jesus showed us the kind of life that God gave to us. So quickly, share that with someone. You got two minutes. Quick. Ah, got Two minutes away. Oh, I have. Okay, come here, man. Linda. I'm not sure what anybody here. You know. <laughs> Yeah, almost three years. We, you know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like that a few, a few months or so. Mm -hmm. Now we have a little house. And we have to move. No problem. I have no problem. I mean, like, you know, I'm asking God to shift life. Instead of still. I think we have that. It's a big house. We have everything there. But I need prayer to decide. No, I think you would pray for me to forgive my brother. I know.
and yet there's a part of you that honestly like yearns and yearns to like like when I see people like <laughs> it's because that's so cute but I have this need to like stop and like tell them about Jesus I do I do I have like this desire to like just do them you know but then of course I, I really live in LA maybe unfortunately live in a rational type of world where I'm like they're gonna sock me you know <laughs> but anyways maybe I live in a little bit of that fear and I just I want to let go of that I just want to be free of that and I don't know if this anxiety is like coming against me because I'm trying to grow in this direction and then something is dampering me here um, I'm just gonna turn my age today I'm just gonna pray that it's not gonna that's not gonna be part of my life this week so, yeah, I've got a professor, lovely priest, and I, uh, yeah. well, I support things like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.